with us. You guys can be seated. again we are in the series called be rich and so we started last week if you missed last week you missed the best message ever so uh, had a lot of fun last week um, came out last week basically said this if I would have said hey we're all rich everyone would have pushed back and said I don't feel rich so we had a little fun we found we were introduced to some of our crazy for my crazy friends uh, who are rich and who you found out to be that was you right and you're the crazy rich people that I know and so anyway we had a good time and just for the record I have 11 pairs of shoes if you have no idea what I'm talking about grab a CD on the way out watch online all right and so what we're going to do, we're going to just have like a, a, a big confession here right now. And so on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to just holler out how many pairs of shoes you have. All right? Can you do that? You, yeah, some of your ladies are like, yeah, I can. All right. So on the count of three, come on, let's hear it. One, two, three. You guys are rich. You guys are rich, right? So we had a lady at the picnic last week. Uh, she had nine pair of shoes. We felt bad, so we had a special offering uh, right there, and just, we just moved the pork and beans over, and we said, let's just put a hat right here, and we gave her some hats. She bought a pair of shoes. She's got 10. She's rich now, so that's all good. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, welcome. All right. Hey, uh, so we had a little fun last week with it. Today, we're going to talk a little bit more about the deception of richness. So we're starting a new series. We started last week at well, five weeks. Um, and we'll talk more. You guys notice the table coming in and how does all that fit in? We'll talk about that today as well and how we're going to be a blessing uh, to an organization that's doing a great job. So inside your program is an outline. I want to encourage you guys to pull it out and we're going to fill in the blanks as we walk through today's, today's talk. You ready? You ready? Yeah. <clears throat> all right. So let's, some of you who have young kids, some of you who have kids that are grown, you'll probably all get this. Remember, I remember when my kids were smaller and we would go to those pizza parlors that would have games, right? You know what I'm talking about? And they would play games and it would cost you like a bazillion and eight bucks. And then they would walk up to the counter and they would have like this long thing of, of it and you would look at it and you're like, I'm pretty sure they're going to get like a Mercedes Benz, I'm, you know? <laughs> I mean, it cost as much as a Mercedes Benz, but then they would hold it up, you know, and then they'd run it through that counter and it'd count off the things. They had 946 of them. And you're like, oh, okay, so you got 946. So look on the wall. There's the, they're right there, 9,500. So it's all those, oh, dad, that, I always wanted that. that that's, like, that's like my favorite. I, I watched it. Oh, I want it. I want that. Oh, my life is going to be different. It's going to be so much better. I'm going to have all, I mean, it's going to be rich, right? And so you get it, you hand it to them, right? And then they, and you're driving home in the car, right? And then, and then they get home and either, either it magically disappears at night or it breaks, right? And then they're like, oh, can we go next week? We can go next week and I can get 10,000 points and I can get another one because my life is so much better with, right? You know what's funny? We don't do this with tickets as adults. You know what we do it with? Dollar bills. And we think if we can just string up enough of them, we'll be happy. We'll be secure. Oh, I always wanted that. I could buy two of them. We buy it. 
We park it. We ride it. We wear it. And we realize it didn't do anything for us. If I could just go back, maybe I could buy the newer version, right? Then I could have 11 pair, not 10. I could have 12, not 8. And I, if I get it, man, my life will be, it'll be rich. And it doesn't. And as adults, what's interesting is when I told you about the kids, you all sit there and you're like, that is so much. His family's just like my family. But as adults, we don't recognize that we do the exact same thing. It's not tickets at the pizza parlor. It's dollar bills in our savings account, our checking account, our 401k. It's the stuff that we park in the garage. It's the things we hang on a, cu on, on a cupboard, uh, in, a, in a closet. And we think, oh, that, that's going to be it. I mean, that's going to be, that's going to bring happiness. And we said this last week at the very top of your outline, that all of us, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are not immune from this. It doesn't matter how spiritual that you think you are. All of us struggle. And here it is at the very top. The struggle that we all have is we can easily put our hope and trust in money, not God. Isn't it true? And we walk up to the counter And our shift in our heart moves from trusting in the provider to trusting in the provisions. And then we get our little noisemaker out, and we go away unhappy because it breaks, it fades, it goes out of season, it goes out of style, whatever the case may be. And then if I could just get another one, I mean, then that would be, make all the difference. Jesus said it this way. We looked at this last week in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and he'll despise the other. You not may not, not might not, not if you're spiritual. You cannot serve both God and money. And here's the thing as we sit with a, as adults that we recognize with kids, but we have a difficult time embracing it ourselves is that money is an attractive, false, little case G God. And we all struggle with that. Because, as your outline says, money promises what only God can give us, doesn't it? It promises that. It's little case G. And we just think that if we get it, if we just have enough, it'll all be good. And we walk up to the counter, and we recognize it isn't. So we just do it again. So in your outline, number one, money promises us happiness, doesn't it? And we think if we stack it high enough, if we get enough of it, it's going to be happy. I mean, it's just like the kid walking up to the counter. Oh, 9,500 points. I've always wanted that, Dad. I've been like praying in the name of Jesus that I would get it. And you're like, I've been praying in the name of Jesus too. And it'll bring us happiness. Second thing is, money promises that what only God can, prom can give us, that it, it we'll have security. That if we just get enough, we stack it up high enough, get enough of it, that we'll be bulletproof, that everything will be fine. Right? All our troubles will be taken care of, and we'll have complete security. Right? And everything will be fine. And see, here's the pushback, right? I already know, because I hang out with, with, with believers all the time. The pushback is, Pastor Dan... I do not serve money. I serve Jesus Christ. And all the church says, amen, right? <clears throat> Let me just ask you this. And be honest about it. Have you ever bought something that you didn't need? Because you thought, be honest, happy and secure. If I just get, that's it, right? Come on, be honest. Our garages are filled with stuff. Our houses are filled with stuff that we didn't need, but we bought it because we thought it was going to bring us happiness, and we thought it would bring us security. So we bought it, and then we recognize that it doesn't. You with me? Number one, we're going to race through this, and we're going to camp down on uh, 1 Timothy here in a minute. So number one in your outline, people who love and trust money, letter A in your outline, Never have enough, right? They never have enough. And look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. 
Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their, what's the word? Okay, now just pause. I'm not asking whether you deserve a raise or whether you're worth it. I'm asking you as you sit here right now, are you content with the provisions that God has given you? Because if the answer is no, then I'm just telling you, your heart has shifted from relying on the provider to relying on the stuff the provider provides for you. Okay? I'm not saying that you don't deserve it and you want to come in the back room and tell me that you know, you're the best and all that stuff. I'm not arguing with that. I'm just saying if you are not content with what you currently have, your heart is shifted. Now, what's interesting, again, about all of us, it's not like we wake up on you know, Monday and go, okay, Lord, my heart is shifted over to my stuff. But it gradually moves that way. That's the struggles that all of us have. And that's Jesus' point, that your heart is going to constantly just be in a pull in that direction because it's a false god and it's attractive. Because it'll bring happiness and it'll bring security, or so we think. Look in Proverbs 18, verse 11. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. In other words, they build a wall around their city. They have guards at the gate. And they think that everything is safe. Their house is never going to be burglarized. Their people are never going to be harmed. They are bulletproof. They are completely safe. There is nothing that they can do because they have stacked it up and they got a long old file of these things and they just got a pack of them and they are bulletproof. And we looked at this verse last week. They, what's the next word? What's, what's the next word? They imagine it's an unscalable wall. In other words, and this isn't to make light of death, but let me just ask you, if a person who dies, whose time is up, who's a billionaire, guess what happens? They, yep. You know what's interesting? The person who's the billionaire and the person who lives in absolute poverty, they take the same amount with them when they go. You want to know how much? Zero. Nothing. They don't take anything with them. Right? And so just because you have a ton of it doesn't make you secure. In fact, money doesn't solve marital problems. Amen. Nor does it solve problems that maybe your kids are making poor choices in life and have habits in their life that they're destroying their life or you or your loved one has that. Money doesn't solve. Sure, it may get, may get you better doctors and it may get, may get you better recovery programs, but it doesn't fix it, does it? All right? And yet, that's the lure of wealth. It's a false God that says, all your problems will be solved. You with me? Yes. Letter B. <clears throat> People who love money and trust money never f uh, uh, find it increasingly difficult to give big. And this is, again, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's, uh, it's studies that have been done, and, and we all want to push back, but here's the reality. People who make $12,000 or less, actually give more percentage than those who make 12000 and more. Okay? Percentage, not amounts, percentage. Okay? And the idea is this. If you have more, you grab more. If you have more, you grab more. If you have more, you grab more. And it's, it's, that, it's that appetite we talked about last week. It's like sugar. It just makes you want more, 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 more. Have more, you grab more, you have more, you grab more. And so you end up living with your fist tight versus a person who is living in what we would consider poverty. <laughs> they, don't, they know that what they have isn't their security blanket. They got to rely on the provider because what they got, not going to work. And they live with their, home, with their, house, with their hands rather, open to what it is. Oftentimes I've said when we talk about, and this message isn't anything about tithing to the church, but tithing isn't about how much. Tithing is about trust and faith. Do you trust the provider or do you not trust him? It's that simple, right? It's a faith issue. Letter C. C is <clears throat> having money in the bank, right? People who love money and trust money have money in the bank, but they have no peace in their hearts. Okay? They have no peace in their hearts. 
And I know, again, the pushback, because I hang out with you guys enough, I know, Pastor Dan, I don't have any money in the bank. I got like, you know, three bucks. But let's take a field trip to your garage, shall we? <laughs> Can we just peek into your closet? Right? Can we walk in and see if you have an extra refrigerator in your garage filled with food? Can we look at that? See, we may not have money in the bank, but we have toys in our house, we have stuff in our house, we have extra things in our house. Would you agree with that? And, and, here, and here's what we know. We know it doesn't bring peace. Does it? So we may have a fat bank account, we may have a lot of cool toys, but it doesn't bring peace. Yet, we're just like the kid at the counter. But dad, that's going to make me, that's like, I've dreamed of that since I was like six. You're like, you're seven, okay? What's the big deal? It's like one year, all right? Get over it. Proverbs 15, verse 16 says this. Better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil, right? Again, wealth doesn't fix marriages, Wealth doesn't fix kids that have gone off the rails. Wealth doesn't fix loved ones who are making poor choices. It doesn't do that. And what's interesting, you can jot this down. This, this is free for because uh, I love you guys. When a marriage is going through trouble, three things they do. You ready? Buy a car, buy a house, have a kid. All in hopes that it will turn things around. But wealth doesn't do that. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't solve the problems that they have. And so having a lot isn't going to fix the turmoil that a person may be going through in your life. You with me? Okay. So then, then we said, so how do we pivot that? I mean, we all recognize that. We all sit here and go, tell me something I don't know. But how do we pivot that? How do we keep our heart from transitioning where we're, where we're relying on what has been given to us to the one who has provided for us, right? That's the whole series. This whole series, series is to get our heart in check to make sure that it doesn't go to a place where we're trusting in the stuff in which we have. So in your outline, we're going to build on this throughout the series, and it says this. It says, God has blessed me with more than I need. I'm rich. I will not trust in riches, but in him who richly provides, right? And that's what we're going to build on each week, because that's the goal. And here's what we all know, and I've had the privilege uh, to sit in a room uh, several times with people in the congregation who are in the last moments of their life. And I, I will, as God is my witness, I will, we will sit, and I've never had one of them say, hey, Pastor Dan, get my checkbook over here. Tell me how many zeros I have behind that comma. You know what they asked me to do? Can you read the 23rd Psalms? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Right? Will you, will you read me where Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled? You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we were not so, I would have told you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back again, and I'll receive you myself. The world may not see me, but I will see you. Because I live, you shall live also. They, they never say, show me the picture of my car. So, so here it is. I mean, and we know this. We know this. Why would you wait at the end of your life and say to the pastor or say to your loved one, read me the scriptures to comfort my heart that God is with me. Let me rely on the promises of him. Why would you wait to the end when you can do it now? I mean, that's what Jesus is saying. Why would you do that? Why would you live a moment of your life trusting in when you can trust in the one who provided it for you? Why would you do that? And see, all of us are here, and we all have the same problem. It's like there's a big pool that says, no, no, this is far more attractive. And if you just come over here, man, life will be happy and life will be secure. And we keep walking up to the counter and we go, I want that. Oh, I always wanted that. I wanted that. You with me? 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is the verse that we're going to camp out for the rest of the, series, the, the message. Paul writes Timothy and he tells him, hey, whenever you come across believers, here's what I want you to do. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor put their hope in wealth. And we looked at this last week. 
which is so uncertain. But to put their hope in God. I mean, why would you put your trust in your stuff when you can trust the one who's given you the stuff? Who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Well, why would you for a moment allow your heart to slide over, to pivot and get into your stuff when you can, you can trust the one who's given it to you? Why would you do that? And so then he lays out in the next couple of verses what to do to keep our heart from sliding over and shifting over to really where it needs not to be. And so in your outline, so how do we, and this is the question that we have, so how do we prevent our heart from going over there? Because we all have that struggle, so how do I keep my heart from doing that? Verse 18. You ready? Verse 18 says, command them. Okay? Not suggest, not remind them, but it's a command. It's an instruction that's given that Paul says to Timothy, when you come across believers, I want you to command them to what? To do good and stop. Not to be good. Because that was already given by Jesus. Jesus already said, you are the salt, you are the light of the world. Jesus already said <clears throat> that your yes ought to be yes and your no, your no. Jesus already said that you are to live above reproach. He's already told you all those things. So he's not talking about being good. As believers, that's an automatic. That is why are we having a message on this, Pastor Dan? We already know what Jesus has done for us compels us. But he says, do good. Do good. Why would he do that? Why would he say to the believers who are wealthy, to be good. And he goes on and he says, to be good in good deeds. Not to be good, but to do good in good deeds. Number one in your outline. If our heart is going to shift and stay where it needs to be, I, then I need to make sure that I am not an average do-gooder, but I am above average do-gooder. We don't want anybody to be average do-gooders at the church. We want everybody to be above average, and that's, that's Paul's point to Timothy. Listen, we all know that we should be doing, right? And so we just kind of fall into the average, but he's going, no, no, you don't understand it. You are a believer. You're rich, but I don't feel rich. We'll get into that later. You're rich, and I don't want you to be an average person. No one wakes up and goes, you know, I'm just hoping to be an average dad. You want to be an above average dad, above average mom, above average employee, an above, above average boss. No one wants to be average, right? You want, to, you want to be above average. And so he goes to them and he says, I want you to be above average. And he says, and here's how you're going to do it. <clears throat> you're going to have good deeds and you're going to be generous and you're going to be willing to what? You're going to be willing to share. And here's it is. And this is going to be hard for us to swallow. So let's just hold on to it. All right. We are a rich people. We already established that you have more than 10 pairs of shoes at your house. And here's the struggle that we all have. Because we are rich, the temptation is to pull away from doing good and to consume it all for ourselves. Because when you have more, you want more. When you have more, you want more. When you have more, you want more. And here's what's true in biblical times. It's true in today's world as well. That with our wealth comes extra responsibilities, but also comes along in there is we have more conveniences, don't we? Now, this isn't to say anything bad. This is not about feel guilty about being an American and being rich. That's not what this message is, okay? We live in a country where many people have someone who goes and takes care of your lawn work for you. That's a rich person. Now, I know what you're saying. I don't feel rich. I get it. I get it. We have people who come and clean houses. We have people who take cars through car washes. We have people who take shirts and blouse and pants and so forth to the laundromat and have them pressed and cleaned. Right? We have all kinds of services, don't we? We have, as crazy as it sounds, we actually have pantries filled with food. And here's Paul's point. When you're wealthy, there's responsibility in there, but there's also extras in there that buys you more time 
And if you're not careful, you will consume that extra time on yourself. And it will become have more, grab more, have more, grab more. Now, I know what you're saying. You go, well, I don't feel rich. And again, this isn't about making you feel guilty about being an American and living in a great country. But we live in a country where we think we have a right to be off two days a week. Right? We work five days, we're off two. We have a right to that. You, you realize that some of us are, are wealthy enough where only one person in the house has to work. And here's what's crazy. Some of you may have three, four, five people in that house, and that one person working those five days brings in enough money to pay for the transportation, the housing, the food. That's incredible. You recognize that there are places in the world that if we were to share that story with them, they would go, no. Because every day they go and scavenge for what they can get to eat. And we walk to our pantry. Again, this isn't about feeling guilty. This is just simply to recognize, to pause and say, we are a rich people. And Paul's point is, biblical times as well as in contemporary times today, that with wealth is going to become, there, there's going to be extras. And we just need to make sure that we're responsible with the extras. That we don't consume it for ourselves, but that we look for ways to be above average do-gooders to do good for others with it. And you do the exact same thing with your extra time as I do, wasted. Every single one of us. And I'm not saying don't have hobbies. I'm not saying it's not right to go golfing or fishing. I'm not saying any of that stuff. I'm just saying the temptation is that we have extra, and so we end up using it for ourselves. And Paul's saying, just be careful. I want you to be above average do-gooders. I want you to do good with the extra that you have. If you work 60 hours a week, and let's just assume that you sleep for eight hours a day. Some of you look like you need to sleep a little longer than that. You will have, on average, 52 hours of extra time a week. What do we do with it? Paul would say, are you an average do-gooder? Are you above average do-gooder? Do you do good with the extra times that you have? And I already know the pushback. Pastor Dan, I'm busy. I know we're all busy. And that's the point. What are you doing with it? Is it to consume it for yourself? Or is it to spend it and give it to somebody else to do good? You with me on this? You with me on this? <clears throat> so that we need to make sure that we're generous. And he goes on in verse 18 and he says, be generous <clears throat> and that we need to be willing to share as we give out to others. All right, we need to make sure that we're careful. What do you think impresses God more? And as I was reading through this passage, I was thinking, you know, our assumption is wealthy people are generous people because we'll hear on the news and whatever that so-and-so who's a bazillionaire gave $10 million to some medical cause or some cause and everyone will hoo 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 yay, yay, and all that stuff. And we all sit back and we all make the assumption that wealthy people are just incredibly generous. But studies show the exact opposite. Study shows the less you make, actually the more percentage you give, not amount, but the percentage you give, where wealthy people may give larger amounts, but their percentage is much smaller. And so I, you, you sit here and you think, what impresses the creator of this world more, the amount or the percentage? What do you think it is? What do you think it is? You say, it's a trick question, Pastor Dan. I don't want to answer it because I'll probably be wrong. Let me, let me take you to a passage to explain to you what impresses the Creator. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. <clears throat> let me set it up for you. Jesus is, has His disciples with Him. They're going to the temple. When, the temple, uh, when you would take an offering at the temple, it would be much different than it is in churches today. They would actually walk forward. So there would be a table in front. Uh, the priests would give the message and so forth. They would bring up their offering in front. There would be some type of container. Biblical times, there's probably some type of clay uh, container of some sort. And there wasn't paper money. You couldn't pay by text. You couldn't email it in. You couldn't write a check. You carried your cash in. And it was typically coins 
not so much paper, all right? And so they would carry the coins in, and they would walk their offering forward, and then they would place it in the offering container, right? And, and so what people would do is they would listen to the amount of noise that was being made as they dumped it in to determine whether they were a fat cat rich or whether they were poor. And so you could imagine, I mean, all eyes are on you. You walk down the aisle, you got your basket, you got your bucket, you got whatever it is, and you're going to bring the offering, and everyone's just sitting there going, is this guy a fat cat or is he, is he poor, right? So Jesus has his disciples. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. Jesus sits down opposite the place where the offerings were being put, and he watched the crowd put their, uh, put their money into the temple treasury. <clears throat> Many rich people, what did they do? They threw it in. You want to know why? Because they wanted everyone to go, oh, rich. They wanted to have the big old ka-clunk sound in it. They wanted to make everyone go, I'm impressed. I wonder what she does. I wonder what he does. And so they threw in large amounts, verse 42. <clears throat> but, but, the, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of of a penny. Now, if you have a King James, it'll say a widow's mite. That actually is a word that they made up. It was an amount that was so small, there was no value to it. All right. So if we were to talk in today's world, uh, a common laborer, um, if we were to use the minimum wage in our, in our, in our in the state of California, is 10 bucks an hour. So what she threw in was roughly six minutes of labor. So it would be equivalent to us throwing in about two bucks if you made 10 bucks an hour, okay? So she walks forward, and all these fat cats are going, pff, pff, wow, I wonder what they do. She walks forward, and here's what they hear. Nothing. Nothing. No noise, no splash, nothing. So Jesus calls his disciples to him, and he tells them, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. And you know what their response is? Their response is the same as you when you watch the news and you go, he gave $10 million to that college? That's crazy. Well, if you're worth $5 billion bucks, what's $10 million? Right? They gave out of their extra. Right? They gave out of their extra. And Jesus wasn't impressed. And he pulls his disciples. He goes, no, no, listen, here's what it is. They walk into their cupboard and they go, I don't need that, I don't need that, I don't need that, I don't need that, I don't need 12 pairs of shoes, I only need 11, and I'll bring that out, and I'm going to give it to someone who has need, and I'm going to feel good about it because I gave it to them. The truth is, be honest with it, the truth is, it didn't cost you anything. You gave out of your wealth. You had nine belts, you can only wear one, so you gave one away. Are you with me? So these people came forward, and they gave out of their extra. And Jesus goes, not impressed. But the widow, she came in, and she gave all that she had. And the verse goes on in verse 44, and it says, uh, they gave out of their wealth, the extra, but she gave out of her poverty, putting in, what's the word? All she had to live on. She emptied down her wallet. And Jesus said this. Jesus said, her heart is richer for God than all the fat cats that made the big old splash in putting in the amount. Because they gave out of their extra, she gave out of her poverty in her life. See, and here's the thing. This is where we're all at. We all struggle with this. And we're all going to go home and wrestle with it and go, man, I, I agree with Pastor Dan, but ugh. we give out of our extra, not out of our poverty. We walk into our closet and go, I don't need that shirt, those shoes, those pants. I don't need that can of beans, right? And we give out of our poverty, or I mean out of our wealth, not out of our poverty. Because deep down inside, and this is where we all struggle, deep down inside, that if I just have enough of these, I'll have happiness and security, and I don't want to give it all away. And so I'm going to hold on to it, because that's what I think is going to bring me happiness, and yet we all know it doesn't. 
And yet we, keep, we just keep on trying. And Jesus says this, and this is what's so amazing. When it comes to him being impressed with, with amounts, he says, I, I don't care how many zeros you have behind the comma. I'm interested in your heart. And this is what the series is. This isn't about money. This is about the position of our hearts that we don't trust in the provisions that's been given to us, but we trust in the pro- provider who's given it to us. We got it? We got it? Number two, the second thing is this. If we're going to break the habit and take it, uh, shift our hearts back into trusting the provider, <clears throat> we need to make sure that we're not giving spontaneously in our giving, and there's nothing wrong with that, but that we have predecided how much and to whom we're going to give to. And so we need to make sure that we, we spend time. The vast majority of people don't do that. The vast majority of go, oh, that's a good idea, I'll do that. Oh, that's a good idea, I'll do that. And you know when you figure out at the end of the year how much you actually gave is when you do your taxes. You go, oh, I had no idea, right? And, I, and I'm just saying this. You, you need to make sure that you're thinking about it on the front end. If you're going to be an above average do-gooder, whatever that number is, whatever that percentage is, you need to determine what it is. You need to make that decision, and then you need to live your life that way, and you need to set that amount, and you need to say, this is what I'm going to do. Now, now, because otherwise, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to give over, we're going to give on the leftovers, and really what Christ is interested in is in our heart. When Tammy and I first got married, and when we first came to Christ, that was it. We set out on an amount, and we were going to give a percentage of what we were making. And when I was a youth pastor and we had a real small youth group and church and stuff and money was tight and all the houses were being built in Antioch, Oakley, and Brentwood, and we'd go to a house, we'd go, oh, I love it, but we can't afford it. Well, why can't you afford it? Well, because we've determined a percentage that we're going to give and I can't afford a house payment and still follow through. And year after year after year, we didn't get, we weren't able to buy a house because we had set on a percentage and we weren't going to violate that. And when you have little kids growing up and you're like, oh, I want them to have a front yard. I want them to have a backyard. I want to have our own place. I want to remodel. I want to do all this stuff. And the reality is we had decided on a a percentage and we couldn't. And now as I look back 25 years in the ministry, and we're certainly, you know, way past all that, God has been good. But when I look back in my ministry career, I look back to those days where we were living in poverty, but we were trusting (laughs) the Lord completely, and God provided, and my heart is richer because of that, because of his faithfulness in our life, and we could have easily said, you know what, that doesn't matter, I got to take care of my family, I got to do what, no, no, God, you're going to be first in every area, and I'm not going to violate that in my life. And we need to do that if we're going to be above average do-gooders. We're going to have to predecide in advance how much, what is the percentage that we're going to give, and to whom are we going to give it to? Who is it? Don't don't just walk through the year and at the end of the year look back and go, oh, I only gave or oh, I gave. Make the determination. Sit down, seek out the face of the Lord, and ask Him what it is and how much. Here's what this series is all about series is about our hearts being in the right place, making sure that we're trusting in the provisions, uh, the provider rather, versus the provision. And so several months ago, we have a team, an impact team that we met, I met with from the church, and I asked them to do this. I said, here's what I want to do. I want to make an impact in the lives of an uh, organization who's doing great work in our community, Okay. And I want, as a congregation, to practice being good at being rich. And corporately together, to practice being good at being rich. And so the group went out, and they did a bunch of vetting and had different ideas, and they landed on Kaleidoscope, who has the the table in in the lobby area. And it's an organization that ministers to and helps people who family members have been diagnosed with cancer, and they do counseling, and they... They do all kinds of amazing things. There, there's very little overhead. I think there's one person that's, that's part, part, part time. Everything is run by volunteers. Okay? And they do a great job. And this is what I want to do over the next couple weeks. I want you, you have an envelope around you. 
I want you to take home your envelope and I want you to pray about how much God would have you to give to them. And as a church, I want to bless them. I want to say thank you for making a difference in the lives of the people. We are a rich people and we want to be good at being rich. And we want to bless you that you may go out and make a difference in other people's lives. So we have a little video. We're going to watch a video. It's about four minutes long. The message isn't over. So hang out, and I'll come back and wrap it up. Over the next couple weeks, we're going to be talking more about this. There's envelopes around you. And I know, you know, this goes con contrary to what you're supposed to. You're supposed to close the deal, get the money, and shake them down, right? But I'm going to trust that God's Spirit's going to work in your life. And that, that, you're, that you're going to seek Him out. And that you're going to give a percentage to bless them. This isn't for us. Not a nickel of it's going to come to us. Okay? In fact, 
to be honest with you, I struggled with them even being here with a table because I didn't want them to think that they've come here to give to us. If their service will work for you and you have somebody in your family that needs it, by all means use it. But my heart is we invited them here to bless them, to give to them. And I'm going to trust that God's spirit is going to touch your heart and we're going to be a a big blessing because we don't want to be average do-gooders. We want to be above average. We we don't want to be rich and be bad at being rich. We want to be good at being rich. And we want to provide for them. Let me close with the message and we're going to... You didn't put your outlines away, did you? Pull them back out, kids. Come on. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. And here is a huge point that, folks, you got to grab a hold of. This is the take-home truth. If you're going to keep your heart from shifting over and trusting in the provisions that have been given to you, here it is in your outline. Our giving and our serving redirects our heart. Your giving and your serving redirects your heart. And if your heart is in the right place, then when our heart is in the right place, everything we do financially is going to change. Because the temptation is have more, get more. Have more, get more. And in order to break that, You've got to recognize that you're rich, that God has provided for you, that you're going to be a wise steward of what he's entrusted, and you're going to use the extra time to do good, and you're going to use the extra that you have to be faithful in keeping your heart focused on him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love.